there were hippies in San Francisco on a family vacation. We went to San Francisco in the summer of 1968, and we actually saw a hippie. It was amazing. Um, but the story I want to tell happened uh, uh, maybe a few months later. Uh, my brother Tom and myself and my cousin Randy, we, had, uh, we often frequented the uh, gravel pits behind Porter, just north of Porter Avenue. I don't know what they're called. I don't know if they exist anymore. But we used to do many uh, adventures there. And one afternoon, we decided to take our bows and our arrows and try to shoot fish in these gravel pits. They filled up with water. And there wasn't a YouTube video that you could watch to figure out how to do this. You just had to figure it out. So we got some string. We tied the string on the thing. And we're going to go shoot some fish. Uh, my cousin lived very close to that on Ithaca Street, and we would walk from Meyer to Porter and then a few other streets I don't remember, and we'd get to Ithaca, pick up my cousin, take our bows and our arrows, we'd cut through the, uh, the school yard of, uh, that existed there, and from there you got into the gravel pit area. And I remember that day, we got into the gravel pit area, and my cousin Randy just stopped, and without a word to us, pointed his bow straight up into the arrow, notched the thing, and let it go. And the first thing we learned is that when you do that, the arrow goes out of sight. And what goes up must come down. So what do you do? And that's my question for you. Do you run or do you stay put? Okay, I want you to contemplate that uh, through this sermon, and we'll come back to it. As Pastor Jim said, we're in a series. We're following uh, the little booklet here with all the different uh, topics and trying to figure out what the Bible has to say about each one of them. And this past week was risk-taking. I looked up the word risk-taking in the dictionary, and this is what it says. Risk-taking means taking actions which might have unpleasant or undesirable results. And that's it. Clearly, this was written by a non-risk-taking person. I mean, there's no mention of good things that might possibly happen. It's just actions that might have an unpleasant or undesirable result. And I think many of us feel that way about risk-taking. Uh, if you take a risk, you might get hurt. Uh, my wife was raised in a family. Uh, uh, my mother-in-law was very much into that mode you're going to get hurt if you try uh, something. They lived on, a, on 40 acres. They had a, a little creek in the back uh, of that 40 acres. And not one of the four children knew how to swim because you might drown. And I, my, my feeling is you might drown if you don't know how to swim. So you should learn how to uh, swim. You might get hurt. You might look foolish. You might fail. Uh, in fact, Often, risk-taking ends in failure. My family uh, had a habit of going to Godwin Public School. They had a swimming pool, and I think on Wednesday nights, it was family night, and my parents would take us there, and they had a low diving board, and they had a high diving board. And my brother and I learned how to do many things off the low uh, diving board. But one day, we thought, let's do something on the high dive. Let's, and the goal was to do a somersault off the high dive. Now, I remember that, you know, thinking, how hard can it be? Uh, if, if I don't make it, the pain is only going to last for a little bit. And so I muscled up my courage. I went to the end of the board, and I thought, on a low dive diving board, you have to actually do some effort to get going in a circle. Uh, but on the high dive, you're so high up, I thought, all you have to do is get going. And by the time you'll get there, you'll be a once around. So I did it. I did a somersault off the high dive, but I only got three quarters of the way, and I landed on the back of my legs, right, smack. And it hurts for more than just a minute. It hurts, the, uh, you know, it hurt the rest of the evening, and I didn't try that again for 15 years. It took me 15 years to get over that one failure. I think that's, that's true for a lot of us. We try things. And then it doesn't go so well, and so we decide that maybe the status quo is okay. Or 
uh, not trying something new is okay. So many of you, when you go out to eat, you go to the same restaurant that you always go to. And when you go to the same restaurant, you usually order the same thing because you know it's good. I mean, why take a chance, go to a different restaurant uh, or order something that you've never ordered before and then you didn't enjoy it? You look forward to going out, you go out, and then it, it, it's a dud. Why take the chance? You already know what you like. Why not just have that thing that you like? You will enjoy yourself and that's the end of it. So we don't want to try new things. But the problem is we end up settling in life. See, you figured out that restaurant that you always like. At some point, you went to it the first time. And at some point, you ordered that thing that you liked for the very first time. And you didn't know if you'd like it or not like it. So you've gotten to where you are at by trying things. But now you've maybe settled on these things. Because you don't want to have a bad experience. You don't want to look foolish. You don't want to fail you don't want to get hurt. But in the end, maybe, maybe some of you are feeling somewhat bored in your life or unhappy or you feel like you're living in fear. The fear of failure is really controlling most of your life. But you're stuck. It's like you remember doing that half or three-quarter somersault and landing on the back of your legs and it's not a good feeling and, and you can't go forward and you can't go back. And you just feel stuck. Well, how do you get unstuck? Now, if you're happy with your life and everything is hunky-dory and, you, you know, your marriage is as good as it can be, your family life, your work life, uh, your, you know, your service uh, for the Lord, uh, the, then there's no problem. The only way that you're going to step out is if you have the need to step out. So how do you get unstuck if that's what you want to do? A few things. Number one. Understand that life is about growing. It's about growing. In Genesis, the first words that God had to say to the two human beings that he had created. Remember it? And God said to them, do you remember what it is? Be fruitful. What is it? Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth. You know, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every, every creature that moves along the ground. Go out and do something. Uh, have a purpose to your life. We read this past week, uh, this, the, the reading for today, the verses, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. What's God's plan for your life? Are you interested in discovering it? 1 Corinthians 15, 58, my dear friends, stand firm, don't be shaken, always keep busy working for the Lord. You know that everything you do for Him is worthwhile. What is God's purpose in your life? Understand that God has a purpose in your life, but how are you going to figure out what that purpose is if you don't go out and try some things? If you don't go out and do some things. Number two, Understand that all of life is a risk, and we'll come back to that one. Number three, give yourself permission to fail. That fear of failure is what keeps us from trying anything new. Uh, I love uh, this past week on Thursday, we read from Ecclesiastes. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. What he's talking about is peop are people that are always looking for things to be in the perfect condition before they attempt to do something. I'm going to do this, but not right now. I, mean, I, I want to study and go in this direction, but not right now. I want to get a new career, but not right now. I want to do something about my marriage, but not right now, because the, the circumstances, the conditions aren't exactly right. Whoever watches the wind will not plan. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap, because there's never that perfect time. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in the mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let not your hands be idle. And, and what I, I, li I like about this uh, couple of verses as opposed to the uh, definition that I read, 
look how positive, positive it is. Sow your seeds in the morning. At evening, let not your hands be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally as well. Such a positive thing. You're going to try to do something. Try to do two things, and maybe one will work and one won't, but maybe both will work. It's like he's emphasizing the positive side and not the negative side. Uh, Ecclesiastes or uh, Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us is able to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or think of. This verse is about you do the little thing that you do, but God can take whatever it is that you do and make it into something. Now, maybe the thing that God wants to make into something is number seven on your list. So you've got to try number one, two, three, four, five, six, then seven. That's the one that God wants to act. But you don't ever get to number seven because you have to go through one through six. Give yourself permission to fail. It's okay to fail. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. Number four, don't worry about what other people think of you. We all have this notion that everyone's thinking things about us. And yes, for a moment. You do something foolish, you fail at something, and people will laugh. They'll say something about it to you. But when they go to bed that night, they are not thinking about you. When they go to bed that night, they're thinking about themselves. They're thinking about what other people are thinking about them. People are way more absorbed with their own lives than they are worrying about you. Don't worry what other people think. Um, if you're in school, if you're a kid in school and you haven't started band yet, I recommend the French horn, the trumpet, any one of those instruments because that will help you get over the fear of failure. Because there's three valves. There's like 40 different notes that you can play, but there's only three valves. And so one valve can play nine different notes. And the chances of you getting the right note are very slim. It's one out of nine. So you take that instrument and you will get over the fear of failure and what people think of you. I thank God for that I took up the trumpet. Number five, volunteer for things that push you. Volunteer for things that push you. Why? Because it's only when you uh, are in circumstances that you are pushed that you can discover Christ in you. We read Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. If you never attempt to do anything that you need Christ for, how will you know that he's alive in your life? See, if you only do the things that you know that you can do, then when you're done doing those things, then you've done what you knew what you could do. You've not left any room for Christ to work in you. You only discover Christ in you when you do things that you know that you can't do so that when you do them, you knew it wasn't you. It was him in you. Volunteer for things that push you. Years ago, I went on a, a bachelor party thing to Vancouver Island, and they had a bungee jump thing over a river, 140 feet, and so I signed up. I paid my, I forget how much money it was, but it was enough money to make a Dutch person do what he doesn't want to do. See, once you pay, you're forced. It doesn't, you can get up and they can tie you up and then you've got to inch yourself on the plank and you look down in this raging river and you look at the cord and you go, is this really going to work? It doesn't matter. You've already paid. You can't get out of this. You've got to go. That's why, that, you know, a lot of things are hard for us to do. But they're easy to do if you get into the situation, if you get into a culture, if you sign up for a team and now the coach is making you do things you would never have done on your own. In 1975, I signed up for a, a, a program that forced me to go to Ogden, Utah, and I had to knock on doors. I had to share my faith. I had to teach vacation Bible school. I had to teach Sunday school. I had to give them the first sermon of my life. But I didn't voluntarily do all those things. I just voluntarily signed up for a program that I didn't know what we were going to do. And once I was there, I had to do it. So what can you volunteer for? What can, how can you step out, volunteer for something that forces you to take a risk? Because it's, it's when we take a risk that we discover who we are. A few months back, we uh, did a 
a retreat with uh, some of the young men of this church, and each one of them got up and shared their favorite verse and some testimony with it. And uh, Doug Leach actually shared a little bit about stepping out and taking a risk, starting a business. Doug, why don't you come up here? Where, oh, he, he left? No, here he is. <laughs> Do we have a microphone somewhere? I know Jim was using the wireless one, but which one? Yellow one. Okay, is it on? Hello. So you're taking a risk by coming up here a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you could fail miserably. Yeah. Didn't yesterday's reading say go out on a limb? And <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you guys are all here to watch the branch break, I guess. <laughs> So Doug shared a powerful testimony, and uh, it was a 45-minute one, uh, so we don't have 45 minutes today, but uh, maybe you can give us a little essence of it. You wanted to, Doug, by the way, owns a business uh, that he started. He wraps things. Mm -hmm. um, we do signs, stickers, signs, details. Signs, stickers, yeah. vinyl yeah. stuff that sticks on everything. Yep, pretty much. So if you want your car wrapped with crazy things, you can do that. Mm -hmm. or your hat, or your briefcase, or your <laughs> motorcycle, or anything, really. Mm -hmm. right? Banners. Okay, banners. <laughs> so you had, you had worked for somebody mm -hmm. in this business before, yep. but then you saw an opportunity to start your own. So then what did you do? Well, it wasn't really I saw an opportunity to start my own. It was, I had always wanted to, and I, I saw that I was getting a lot older, and nothing was getting easier, and <laughs> the money wasn't going to be there to do it. So um, finally, my dad... Uh, and me talked about it for some time, and, and we put a plan together to make it happen. Sure. Um, we spent about a year researching, uh, getting back into it, things that had changed since then, um, looking at equipment that was selling and seeing what it would go for um, to get an idea of what we were going to need to spend. And uh, finally, after about a year, we found what was the greatest deal of all. Um, it was a whole company out of Chicago, so it was everything that we would need. Um, they were up and running. We could come down there. They'd offer training with the equipment. Um, it was, it was too good to be true. <laughs> Every, everything we needed, but it was, uh, it was about three times what we were willing to spend. Um, so my dad ended up, uh, helping out even more and he, he borrowed from his 401k and, uh, and helped out to make it so we could do this. So we went down there and, and we put a deposit down on it and we got down there and things were a little odd. They, uh, didn't speak any English. He had a translator lady that was there that, Anyways, um, it, it was very difficult to really learn much, but we put our deposit down. It was a non-refundable deposit, and it was a significant enough amount that we weren't, weren't going to go back on it. <laughs> um, and then we had, uh, part of the agreement was that they got to finish out their jobs that they still had going on before they, they were moving to California and didn't want to transport all this equipment, was what they said. So we came back a month later, and one of the, the big sell points for this for us was that there was a... Uh, there was probably $10,000 worth of material that came along with it, which was great for me needing to be able to get familiar with this, have waste product that I could use, you know, to be able to, to get, get familiar with everything, you know. So we got back down there and uh, came with a big box truck to load everything up, and, and nearly all the material was gone was one of the first things that we noticed. And something just didn't feel right, didn't seem right, didn't. But at this point, we're, we're committed that we've spent enough that we were going to, we're going to do it. So um, complained about it a little bit, but we ended up paying the rest, taking it home. We got it home, and then, uh, and then one thing after another, it, it fell apart. It didn't work. <laughs> um, the, the software, which is a relatively expensive software, um, and we had checked to make sure it was all legit software while we were there. We got back and found out that they had, uh, they had taken all the original versions off, and they had downloaded uh, cracked hacked versions of that software back onto there so that it was appeared to be functional, but wasn't. Um, we ended up finding out that all the pieces of equipment, um, this guy, a year later we found out, would buy broken for next to nothing and slap them back together with knockoff Chinese parts. And he would build the appearance of a company um, and then find poor suckers like us that <laughs> That wanted so to spend way too much money on it. You <clears throat> had all this hope, you took a risk, and then you ended up with nothing. Yep. 
A lot of debt. <laughs> a lot of debt. And then your dad needed his money back. Well, then uh, when we got it back, um, one of the other things about this printer, uh, which is probably the most expensive piece of equipment, it eats ink. It, it self-maintenances itself. It goes through four to $600 worth of ink a month if you don't use it, if it just sits there. Um, so to go get a regular job at $10 an hour, $12 an hour, $15 an hour, pay our regular bills and be able to maintain this, this printer, um, it's not really in the cards. Um, so that put us in a difficult situation. Do we put everything into the shop and try to move forward with this, or do we try to give up on this? And anyways, um, we were too far committed to be able to give up on it, basically. So we uh, we started selling stuff, and you know we had stuff we didn't need. We had I, I buy and sell anything with motors, basically, on the side, um, and we had stuff we didn't need. So we started selling some of that stuff and, and paying to fix this and to fix this and to fix this and one thing after another. Um, and then we started selling stuff we did need or we did use every day. Um, we started selling the television, sell the grill, sell the <clears throat> on and on and on. Um, <clears throat> when I started this, I had two people that I asked, you know, if 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 things go bad, will you be there to to help out, you know? And uh, and I, I finally ended up going to one of them after we had gotten about the end of our rope with what what we could sell, what we could scrounge up for money of their own. And he offered me a job. Um, it was a prevailing wage job out of state, which was a huge help. Um, we were quite a bit behind on our rent. That that got us caught back up with basically an entire summer's worth of not uh, not being able to pay our rent. Um, and then uh, just as we were caught back up, that job ended. Um, and we, we still had no money. We still didn't have our equipment fixed. We still weren't able to, to use any of the equipment to make any money at the shop. Um, Still needed to maintain that printer. Um, we still had a ridiculously large utilities bills, um, which is a whole nother story. But that we ended up selling uh, selling our second car that we didn't need. Um, then finally, we ended up selling our our only car. <laughs> um, and yeah, we we hit rock bottom, or so I thought. And then uh, my dad called and said that he lost his job. So now he needed his money too. <laughs> so it was kind of one thing after another that stacked on. So that went yep. out. The build us back up part. <laughs> um, one of the uh, one of the things that we had sold, you know, the kids were into racing quads. One of the uh, the quads that I had bought for parts, um, I, w I was selling off parts of that, and some guy called that had a pretty interesting story as well. Um, but long story short, he had uh, he had a messy divorce situation um, that involved a lot of money from an invention that he had he had come up with that that he was able to take a portion of this and. and Anyway, he had custody of his kids, but he had, he constantly had to worry about what his ex was going to do or come after him for, and he wanted to have something that was 50 cc, so that legally his kids could ride it and she couldn't come after him. But he needed something bigger because his kids were older, so he wanted this frame that I had laying around. <clears throat> we got to talking, and he was asking questions about you know what had happened. Uh, coincidentally, he was an ex pastor before before this whole thing, <clears throat> and I should say leading up to this guy, there was four or five other people that had stopped by and made some <clears throat> really crazy comments about God, having faith, <laughs> things of that sort. But this particular guy, he, uh, he was talking about what his need was and that he was going to try to figure out how to do this, that he could swap these things out. And I said, you know, I, I, got, I got time on my hands. I got, you know, I have the parts here. Bring your other quad and I'll, I'll help you out. And so while I'm doing this, we talked on the phone several times about which parts he wanted on what and how we wanted it set up, you know, and he talked more about uh, about our company and about, you know, what had happened, ideas we could do, um, the situation that we were in. And I should also say, too, that a part of this was uh, um, even though we had been caught back up on rent, I had told our landlord that about our situation and, you know, was kind of asking for help on it, like what were your, your advice be, because he was a business owner as well. And that was kind of a mistake because he realized that he wasn't going to be able to get rent out of us, so he had asked us to leave <laughs> by the end of the month. So we were in a situation where we didn't have 
money, we didn't have a job, we didn't have credit, we didn't have any income. Even if we were to go get a job, um, we still didn't have a place to put all this equipment. We didn't have you know, job history or credit to be able to get approved for a house. So we were kind of in a situation we couldn't, I couldn't see a way out of. <clears throat> um, anyways, so one of my biggest struggles being that I have no way for us to possibly find a home and, and that was one of the things that I talked about with this guy. And, and I, he kept prying at it and kept prying at it, wanting more information. And then uh, finally, when he comes to pick up the quad, <clears throat> he says uh, a little bit more about what he had done with his settlement portion of the money, which was by a large chunk of property. And it had a house on it for him and his kids. And they were going to turn it into some nature development thing out by the lake shore and blah 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 and he says well I went out to look at the property and there's a second house on it I didn't even know about it's a little rough it needs a, a little bit done to it <clears throat> but it's livable and he says if you and your family want it you can have it until you get on your feet and it just blew my mind that <clears throat> I, I had gone through every scenario in my head of any way out of this, and there was none. And, and a random stranger comes and offers you a free house. I mean, it, unbelievable. Um, that was kind of a turning point for me from where I was at in my life at that time. Um, really started to open up my eyes and, and think that maybe there was a, there was a plan for us. There was a reason for this. Um, we decided to, to stay I, I, as much of a schmuck as I felt like for it. I said, you know, we're, we're into winter. We're going to stay here. We're going to ride this out. If, if we owe money in the springtime, I'll, I'll move out and I'll pay it back. And I'll, but we're going we're gonna to rough through this. We're going to keep the kids in school where they're at. We're going we're gonna to make this work, you know. And... Uh, I had also been drinking quite a bit at that time. Um, anxiety had been quite an issue um, over the past several months, and the drinking seemed to help with that a little bit, but then that kind of got carried away. But I started cutting back at this point, but uh, I, me and Anna went out to dinner one night, and we're sitting up at, uh, up at 84th Street, and this old guy comes up and Ask how things are going, and I'm just, yeah, great. <laughs> well, I, I go to your church. You know, I don't know if you remember me or not, or if you recognize me. We had just started coming here. Um, so he keeps kind of prying at questions about about the company, and I kind of don't really feel like talking to him. But <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> he says, "Well, you want to know what I do?" And sure, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> so he tells me a little bit about what he does, and he says. So I guess in some way, shape, or form, you could say I'm kind of a, a high-risk investor. <laughs> and he says, so what do you need to be able to get back on your feet? And I'm, a lot. <laughs> well, what? <laughs> you know? And it's a pointless question, really, I'm figuring, because I have, I have no collateral. I have no... I have no history, I have no credit, I have, I have nothing. Who gives? That was one thing I found out, those people that I thought were really, really close friends that were going to help out. Once you get that low, everybody kind of disappears. So for a stranger to come up and <clears throat> there's a lot more that goes beyond this story, but I mean, a week later, he gave me a check to be able to get the last of the equipment that we needed. And that turned into searching for, searching for equipment, which is where we actually found the same company that we had already bought for sale again. <laughs> With the same story, they're moving. They're, oh, that was infuriating, but <laughs> anyways. Um, I ended up finding a, uh, another guy that was out of Indiana, found on eBay, and he had this plotter that I needed, and it was, it was way more than what I had. I had, I had to, in order to stay in our house, I had to give part of that, that check that I was given 
to our landlord to, to get him happy enough that we could stay there. So uh, this piece of equipment was still more than what I had, and I sent the guy a message, and I said, look, I know I, I hate to be that guy. I hate to be the one that's giving you this lowball whatever offer, but, you know, we've, we've and I told him a little bit about our situation. He said, if you'll, if you'll sell me this, I'll come down and give you cash. Um, I'll even agree to make payments to you on the rest of it if you want, you know, and yada, yada, yada. And, uh, and he asked for my, my number and ends up calling me, and we talked back and forth throughout the course of about a week. And it turns out that uh, um, he also had had a lot of struggles of his own. Um, and right back to the God thing again. I mean, it, it, that, that conversation came up several times with him. But he, he had cancer. He was told he was terminal. Um, so he ended up having to sell his printer. He had almost the exact same setup we did. But he had now the plotter and the rest of the parts that we needed that were left. Um, as well as a whole bunch of signboards and some materials and stuff like that. And he, uh, he finally, after a few times of talking to me, he says, uh, what about if I make you a deal? Uh, and and I, got, I, I want my space back. I want my, what, what if I make you a deal to sell you everything that I have left? And, and what he wanted was barely more than what he was asking for the plotter. And I said, well, I, I really appreciate that. That's absolutely great. But I, I, this is honestly every dime I have, I can't, I can't do it. And he says, okay, well, what about if I, I let you make payments on it? And I said, well, I like the idea of that too, but unfortunately this is a seasonal business and this is the down part of our season. And I said, just in all honesty, I don't have any clientele. I don't have any customers. I don't have any experience with this. I, I, it, it would be rude of me to take advantage of you by telling you that I can afford to take this and make payments on it because I, I won't be able to for several months, you know? I said, well, that's fine. So he agrees to come up and uh, and bring this stuff to me. And he shows up with a, we, we made the deal and agreed on it. And he shows up with a, a 30 foot snowmobile trailer. And inside it, he has the plotter that I needed. He has vinyl storage racks. He has probably double the product that the first company had, that we had lost. In the first company, it was all junk, knockoff, just made to look like there was a bunch there. And this was all premium. 3M, top of the line. I mean, it was it was over double anything that we had lost. And just gave it to us. So me and him are still great friends, as well as the person who was able to make this whole thing happen. So what did you learn from <coughs> this? I mean, you started out taking a risk, and it went south. And what and you thought you were starting a company, but what, what did you really learn? Be careful what you pray for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I joke about this with Jim a lot. This, boy, did I ever learn that lesson. I, I, I've struggled with Christianity throughout my life in, in the way that... I never really had a true connection with, with God or Christianity. But at that point in my life, I was trying the most to. But I, I was doing it wrong. <laughs> but one of the things when this started going bad that I, I, I had asked several people about that I knew and that I prayed about was, how do you have faith? When things are going this bad and they keep getting worse, how do you have faith that it's going to work out? And that how do you have, how, when you have a family that relies on you, how do you have faith that there's going to be food for them tomorrow, that there's going to be a roof over their head? And I prayed about that, and I said, teach me to have faith. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept praying that, not realizing that, the, that that's what was happening. <laughs> no one warned you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, after the fact, Jim's like, yeah, yeah, you got to watch out for that. <laughs> <laughs> but out of this whole deal, I feel like I did learn to have faith. And I feel like... You know, we still have the company, and it's still a, a daily struggle. And it's kind of a to be continued whether this has a happy ending with the financial end of things, but where it brought me in so many ways in my life with how it brought me closer to God and taught me to have faith is... It's changed my life in every, it's changed every part of my life. And it is 
truly the worst thing that I feel like has ever happened to me or happened to our family. But I can't imagine our life without it. That took risk taking to get up and do this. Wasn't that bad though, was it? <laughs> That's the last that last verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. When you step out and take a risk and you're thinking this thing, it probably won't happen that way. Often the things we step out to do never turn out the way we thought. But God often has a better idea. Doug tried to start a business, but he but what he really discovered was faith in a God that loves him and cares for him, which is way better than any business could ever be. So step out in faith. It's how we discover who we are. We discover our gifts by stepping out, uh, risk-taking. It's also how we discover Christ in us. All right, back to the, my, the arrow shot into the air. How many of you would run? Now, how many of you would stay right where you are? Okay. So most of you, many of you said you'll stay right where you are as if. <laughs> I know what your thinking is. You shoot an arrow straight up in the arrow, air, what are the chances of it coming down exactly where you're standing, right? That's what you're thinking? But you never shoot an arrow straight up in the air. It's a little off one way or the other. And let's say you shoot it a little this way and the wind is blowing this way. It could come back right to where you are. It doesn't matter whether you run or you don't run. The chances of the arrow sticking you are equally the same, no matter what you do. And that's the way it is with risk-taking. You can decide not to take a risk, or you can take a risk. Either way, it's a risk. By not taking a risk, you take the risk of not discovering faith. You take the risk of not discovering the gifts that God has you, or the opportunity, or the thing that you are uniquely qualified to do. It's how we learn everything. So take a risk. What risk can you take uh, this coming week? Let's pray together. Lord, we're thank, thankful for Doug's testimony of stepping out and, and being burned and, and being hurt and not knowing what to do. But through strangers, people that he had no connection to, people that um, there was no hope, and yet you are in control. You, you have a plan, and you have a plan for each one of us. But for us to discover that plan, we need to step out and make some mistakes, and we, we will make mistakes. But you're there to pick us up, to carry us on, to bring strangers into our lives, to bring friends into our lives. It'll help us get what we really want, what you have designed for us. Help us to be risk takers in your kingdom. Say this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to, uh, are we going to sing first or what are we doing here? No. Okay. We're going to do communion uh, together. Um, in some ways, if you look at Jesus and what he did, he, uh, you might say Jesus was the biggest risk taker of all. He decided to die on the cross for us. And then he had to wait three days for his father to to, to raise him from the dead. And on the outside, it looks like a big risk. But on the inside, Jesus knew his father. He had total 100% confidence that his father would raise him. And that's the same confidence that we have. That no matter what happens into our lives, God will take care of us. So as we celebrate communion uh, uh, today, let's celebrate it with that notion, that confidence that Jesus had to die for us, and we can have that same confidence that God loves us and will take care of us. So what I would like to do is have you come up uh, by rows. We'll start on this section, go over here, this section, go over here. I don't know what you people in the middle are going to do. Uh, but come up, take uh, the bread and the juice, and take it back to your seat uh, while we sing together. So let's sing and... Uh, Start over here and start over here.
Jesus almost 2,000 years ago had a supper with his disciples before the hardest thing that he had to do to die for us. He took bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, and remember and believe that the body of Jesus was broken for you. sure that meal was confusing to the disciples. They had no idea what was going on. They had no, no idea how difficult their lives would be um, because of what Jesus would do and because of what Jesus called them to do. A every single disciple, uh, according to uh, church history, was martyred except for one. They had a difficult life ahead of them. They had no idea what it would be. But it was a life lived in victory. J Jesus won the victory. We're still struggling along. We have things that are in front of us. I know some of you are struggling with things, health things going on right now, and you don't know what the answer is going to be. You feel maybe like Doug. You don't know what to do or where to go. Everything that you can think of, none of it works. Uh, yet there's a stranger, perhaps, around the corner, something that God is already planning for you. Take, drink, and remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for a complete remission of all our sins so that we can fail and fail and fail again and start again. My closing song.
Isn't it great to be at church? <laughs> and I'm going to miss all of you for the next three months. Sort of. <laughs> Receive God's parting word of blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Amen. Will you join us for a little fellowship through the double?